Good to be with you in the house as we discuss being each other's neighbor. Love thy neighbor. We know it well, don't we? It's a scripture we, we can quote easily. God, we say, well, what does Jesus say to people about, about how they need to be next? And, and everybody says, well, I've got to love God and I've got to love your neighbor. Remember the scripture that uh, comes to mind the most when, we, when we're thinking about loving your neighbor and being a good neighbor is that story that Jesus told. Remember when somebody walked up to him and said, hey, um, who is my neighbor? Remember that scripture? Remember that story? Well, why don't we turn to that quickly in Luke chapter 10, verse 25 to 29. Um, we're going to have a look at that scripture. And a, a religious leader came up to Jesus and said this. He posed this question. Teacher, what requirement must I fulfill if I want to live forever in heaven? Look at the question that that man asked. What he asked Jesus was, hey, Jesus, what's the most important thing that I can do that will dot the, the sentence and put a period at the end of the sentence as regards my eternity? And, and, and look at what Jesus teaches him. Look at what Jesus says to him next. As soon as he asked this question about his eternity, look at what was on Jesus's priority list. Look at what was on Jesus's thought process. He says in, in this, Jesus replied here, he says, what does Moses teach us? What do you read in the law? So the religious scholar answered, it states you must love the Lord God with all your heart, all your passion, all your energy, and all your every thought, and you must love your neighbor as well as yourself. It's what the law stated. This guy was a scholar of the law. He was an academic. He absolutely loved listening and reading and getting into the Word and finding out all the nitty-gritty about what he's got to do. But he didn't know how to do it. Anybody in the congregation feel like that? We can read the Bible. We can, we can study the Word. We can, we can come to church. But then when it comes to actually doing some practical things with what we've learned at church, we struggle. In the, in the face of a difficult situation, the face of a, of a situation that we need to do something, we tend to go with what's comfortable. Come on now, I can't be the only comfortable sinner in the house. We tend to go with what's comfortable. We, we tend to lean towards knowing what's the knowledge, but not doing what's the deed. Does that make sense? We know what the head knowledge is. We know what we ought to do. Didn't Apostle Paul say this? The things I want to do, I don't get to do. And the things I don't want to do, I end up doing. So this religious scholar comes to Jesus and he says, Hey, Jesus, just give me just, just the inside scoop. What, what, what have I got to do? I mean, let's, let's cut all of the law out and where I've got to go and make my tent and when I've got to make this and when I've got to sacrifice. Let's cut all of that out. Tell me, what's the one thing that I can do to ensure my eternity? And Jesus says to him, well, What does the law say? What does the Bible say? What does the Word say? And this guy comes back straight away, or out the bat. He didn't go, well, it could be that scripture in Hosea he's referring to. It could be that scripture in Revelation. It could be that scripture. In, it could be my favorite scripture in Romans. No, he comes out the bat and he says, love God, love your neighbor. And, and as, as he looks at this, Jesus says, well, you got it right. He says, that is correct. Now go and do exactly that and you will live. Go and do. Now at the beginning of this message, we said it's really easy for us to say love thy neighbor. Jesus didn't say go and say love thy neighbor. He didn't say walk around, love your God, love others. He didn't say you must make bumper stickers out of that. He didn't say you must print off Bible card markers in your Bible or bracelets with that on or, or, or posters in your... No, no. He said, go and do exactly that and you will live. Jesus just gave us the keys to the kingdom, the keys to eternity right there in that scripture. He says, all you got to do is love God and love others. Now we come together and I'll be honest with you, it's easier for me to love God than to love others. Forgive me, but some of you aren't that lovable. I'm joking. But the fact is, is that it's easier to love God because we can look around. He's never hurt me. I can always trust him. He's never stabbed me in the back. He's never done anything that's going to pain me. 
He's disciplined me. He's led me. He's grown me. He's shaped me. He's given me my children. He's given me my beautiful wife. He's given me my beautiful home. And, and it's just a miraculous thing of what my God does. But some of you, you've done none of those things. In fact, sometimes in our Christian journey, not in this church, but sometimes the people that we call our fellow believers are the ones that hurt us the most. The ones that can, can send us that scripture via text that just cuts to the quick. And we go, oh, that's not even love. That's just scripture whipping. Am I right? We can even use God's word to get at each other. How sick are we? We can use the church and where I sit in church and, and who comes to church and who offends me and who doesn't offend me and who said what and what colored blouse they wore and what color this tie I should wear and should I wear a tie. And we get so bound up in the law. Did you notice that? Jesus didn't say go back and study the law more. He said go and do exactly that. He called the religious leader out of the law and into action. Isn't that what grace is? God called salvation from the law, Old Testament, and He released it into you, into action, Holy Spirit. And now all of a sudden, the salvation didn't come from the law, but it came from working in relationship with God. Isn't that cool? And when we have that relationship with God, we will want to do. And so Jesus continues uh, sorry, the religious leader then continues and he says this, and I want you to listen to this carefully. Wanting to justify himself. In other words, making an excuse. Wanting to justify himself. He then questions Jesus says, well then who really is my neighbor? Skims right over love God. <laughs> And jump straight in. Yeah, loving God's easy. Jump straight into, well, hang on a second. Wait, well, let's, just, let's, just, let's just clarify who my neighbor is. How many times don't we, wanting to justify ourselves, we use excuses. We use any, any reason to say, hang on, hang on, I, I, that's not my neighbor. This is my neighbor. I'm comfortable to love this person, but not, whoa. Oh, come on. You see, the, this religious leader, he got reading his Bible right. He got loving God right. But he wanted to justify why he wasn't living out loving thy neighbor right. He didn't know how to be a neighbor. He didn't know who was his neighbor. Well, maybe in that moment he did know exactly who his neighbor was. But he was choosing not to want to know who his neighbor was because that would mean that he'd have to get up off his tush and go and do some loving of the person that he didn't really want to love. Later, Jesus went on to say, hey, your neighbor can also be your enemy. Bless them and love them also. But here he was justifying himself saying, hold, hold the phone. Just, just wait a minute. Who then is my neighbor, Jesus? What are you actually asking me to do here? And so we justify ourselves. We often use every excuse to be the kind of neighbor Christ has called us to be. We want to define what kind of neighbor or neighbors we have. And it's very simple. When that nice couple moves in next door to us, that puts our garbage out for us, trims the front, front uh, grass for us, the, you know, that little piece that's shared by both properties and you don't quite know who, who, whose responsibility it is to cut and you don't have to ever do it because your neighbor cuts it for you. Well, those kinds of people we can love all year round. But when that neighbor walks, moves in with that yapping dog and those spoiled brat kids who are constantly peering over the wall and never ever put their garbage out and don't cut the lawn ever, well, those are not my neighbors. Those are somebody else's neighbors. It's like when my son is disobedient, he's his mother's child. He's not my child. Am I making sense? And so we justify ourselves, we justify this reservation of loving others, and we use excuses of prejudice, inadequacy, and pride. 
all three things that grace has removed from you. You see, God's grace didn't come just to give you a pleasant little warm fuzzy feeling. No, it came to remove your excuses so you can get up and go and do. You see, Jesus knew that that scribe, that, that Pharisee, that study of the law, that guy that studied the law, he knew that he was going to try and justify himself. And so he tried to show, well, hang on, if I can remove all of those prejudices, all of the pride and all of your inadequacy, because let's be real, sometimes we have a neighbor that we really want to help, but we don't feel qualified to help or we don't have the means to help. Inadequacy. But grace has given us more than we need to not only help ourselves, but help others. You see, grace is the loving God piece when we get it. When we get grace, that's loving God. When we give grace, that's loving others. Am I making sense? Because you're looking at me like, whoa, what is this about? You mean I'm going to have to actually do something after church and not just go home and go, tick, been to church? Yes. Oh, come on. I went through that for years. Yes, I was in the Methodist church. I went there for exercise. You can get a great leg workout in the Methodist church. Stand up, sit down. Stand up, sit down. Stand up, sit down. It's a great leg workout. But the fact remains is that we, we justify our, our desire. We justify our ability to love others by saying, hang on, they're not like me. I don't know them. And we even make this soft. We even say things like, um, it's a different culture. I, I, I don't think that I should lean in there because I don't understand the situation. You see, the Holy Spirit gives us gifts to be able to understand the situation so we can go in anywhere. In fact, the Holy Spirit even gave the disciples a different language and tongue so that they could go into different cultures, that they could go into different places, so that they could reach out to anybody and everybody. That's the purpose of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The purpose of the gifts of the Holy Spirit into you is that you have every ability to know the culture, every ability to know the situation, every ability to communicate with people. You have those gifts. And so we use excuses to say, hang on, let's just stop the bus. I'm not going to go in there. Have a look at what the definition of prejudice is. Prejudice is a preconceived opinion that is not based on reason or actual experience. When you are prejudiced, you are being unreasonable. Quite frankly, you're being stupid. Who are you to judge? Who are you to say that this person doesn't need grace from you? Who are you to turn to the Most High God and say, Father, I know you have positioned me in this place for such a time as this, but I'm going to keep it all to myself. Thank you. You see, when we get to that place, we are basing our opinion on no real experience. It's usually because we think that we're going to get harmed or injured if we go into that relationship. That's why we prejudice. I, I look at what prejudice does, and, I, and the only thing I can refer back to is the country from which I come. It, it was a country during the 80s and 90s that was completely jam-packed with prejudice. Racial prejudice. Racial prejudice separation. To this day, now the wheel has turned. The moment that the then president, Mr. F.W. de Klerk, handed over the government to the incumbent president, Mr. Nelson Mandela, what people don't know is that the two of them shared the Nobel Peace Prize together because of what they did, one white man for one black man, and what they did to change a country. And everybody lived in this rainbow nation bliss for for, for like two years. We are a new nation. Everybody's equal. Well, at the root of it, there was still prejudice. There was still division. There was still this selfish reservation of wanting to reach out for somebody else. And to this day, right now in our country, we are facing greater difficulties than we did back then. Why? Because prejudice wasn't dealt with. And now we're seeing prejudice destroying an entire country. Now, if prejudice was from God, that wouldn't be happening. Because God doesn't come to rob, steal, and destroy. Satan the devil does. And so any form of prejudice that creeps up into your heart is not from God. It's from Satan the devil to stop you from being a good neighbor. 
It's from Satan, the devil, to stop you, and he'll put even, you'll even put scriptures to your preconceived ideas. You'll even come up with reasonings from the Bible why you shouldn't help that person. Well, you know, they just take my money and snort it up their nose. Well, then don't give them any more money. How about praying for them? How about being in relationship with them? How about walking the journey with them? How about having your mobile phone available at 2 o'clock in the morning without the greatest temptation and need that they can phone you? How about going the extra mile? But I'm sleeping. But I'm going to give them money because that's the easiest way out and then complain about what they do with it because I've given them the wrong help. Am I making sense? And so when we have a look at this prejudice, if you favor some people over others, you're committing a sin. You are guilty of breaking the law. James chapter 2 and verse 9. Now I'm not making, that's not a quote, that's a scripture. James chapter 2 and verse 9 says, if you favor some people over others, you are breaking the law and committing a sin. Any form of prejudice is a sin. Why? Because it brings destruction. And if we have a look at it, the very first thing we need to understand and the very first thing we need to be able to get to in our lives is recognize that we have prejudices. Recognize that you're prejudiced. Oh, no, I'm not, Craig. I've got black friends. What's that got to do with it? Just recognize that at some point you've got some prejudice. I'm not even talking racial prejudice. I'm just talking about, well, you know what? I don't like helping homeless people because they smell. That's a prejudice. I don't like sitting next to somebody in the church that hasn't bathed last week because that's a prejudice. I don't like that person because he speaks funny. That's South African. I mean, that's prejudice. I, I don't, I, I got issues. Let me tell you something. I thought that my country was prejudiced. This country is just as prejudiced. It might not be only along the lines of racial slurs, but there's class distinctions. There's even like county distinctions. If you come from this place, you're not as good as if you come from that place. We all know the Texans are second rate citizens. Let's just get on with it. Oh, come on now. I'm South African, I can say that. You know what I'm getting at? Is that, is that believe it or not, even in your family you have prejudice. Even in the people that you're supposed to love unconditionally, you'll invite that side of the family and not this side of the family. And so when we have a look at it, the first thing we need to do to be a good neighbor, to be that neighbor that Jesus called us to be, to go and do, is just recognize that we have some prejudice. In fact, when we have a look at it, it's in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 18 in the message, it says this, My dear children, let's not just talk about love, let's practice real love. Let's not just, oh, I love everybody. Kumbaya, my Lord. But when that person comes, oh, hang on a second. God's got that. Because according to Psalms, he's handling my enemies. What kind of prejudice is that? That's scriptural prejudice. That's just wrong. And so when we have a look at it, we need to understand that we have prejudices. The next thing we need to do if we want to become a good neighbor is we need to seek to understand others. Go out of your way to get out of your comfort zone around people. Go out of your way to ask questions. Go out of your way to discover about that culture to understand why that person is aggressive, to understand why that person smells, to understand why that person speaks like that, to understand why that person looks like that. Don't just think that you know it all. Don't just think that your culture, your way is the only way. Man, as I travel the world and see people from different cultures and nations around the world, I get to quickly realize that there's a lot of other ways of doing the same thing. Your way is not the only way. And there's a lot of other successful ways that might be even more successful than the way you do it, but because you think it's the only way and it's the only way you've ever done it, anybody else who does it differently must be wrong. Isn't that judgmentalism? And so when we have a look at it, it says this in Romans chapter 12 and verse 9, don't just pretend to love others, really love them. Really, really love them. Let me tell you something, Christians. Lean forward, I want to tell you a secret. Before I don't tell you a secret, we can be really big hypocrites. Christians can talk the talk, 
We can say, love thy neighbor, love God. We can say all those things just like that religious leader. But to actually get up out of the boat and do some effort and, and not do the things you want to do, but do the, I mean, not do the things you have to do or like to do, but do the things you should do. That's difficult. We, we can be hypocritical. We can talk the talk. That, that scripture in Romans chapter 12, you can genuinely love somebody just by reaching out to them, just by asking them that question, just by finding out about them. Ask more why questions. Why, why do you do that? Why do you say that? Why do you respond like Just ask more why questions. Because a why question is a loving question. It's not a why. Did I get that right? Come on now. I'm getting there. A why question shows that you genuinely want to know and understand more about that person. You've just been a neighbor by asking a why question out of love. You've just been a neighbor. All of a sudden, that person says, you know what? He's not just trying to come and solve my problems, which isn't the problem anyway. Let me tell you something. We do this all the time. We look at somebody else's situation or culture and think it's a problem because it's not the same as ours, and we reach in to try and solve a problem that isn't the problem in the first place. The person is quite happy until you point out the fact that they shouldn't be happy with that. What do you mean? Some people come to me in the end, they go, is your marriage okay? Our marriage is great. It's our marriage. We've got our own rhythm. We've got our own thing. We're good. Jesus is at the heart of our marriage, and we love being married. But just because it's different to yours doesn't mean to say that ours is wrong. Amen? Every single person is different. Every single culture is different. Every single marriage is different. Every single parenting approach is different. So just ask more why questions. Because that's how you genuinely find out how you can love somebody. Then next thing you need to understand if you want to be a good neighbor is that you have to love those different from you. How many of you know it's really easy to love those who are like you? How many of you easy? It's easy, especially when you eat the right kind of food. I mean, if you, write, if you like the kind of food I like, we're going to go out all day, every day. I'll hang out with you until the cows come home. You with me? But if you don't like what I like, I mean, don't invite me to a sushi bar. I'm not going to pay that kind of money if they can't cook the food. <laughs> Let's just be real, right? I mean, if you, if you like sushi, that's great. But I mean, I'm paying a ton of money and they just put it on a conveyor belt. I'm paying for a, 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 a circus ride for some fish. I, I don't need, I, you, get what I'm, you get what I'm saying? And so when I look at it, I'm going, okay, I can, I can easily love those who like me. But Jesus wasn't calling us to love those who, we, who love us. Get what I just said? He wasn't calling us to love those who love us. It's very easy as well for us to love those who love us. He was calling us to love those who didn't know about loving God. That's why he gave that first command first. Your first command is to love God, and therefore you must love others. It wasn't a split thing. They, they were linked. Loving God was intrinsically wound into loving others. We love others to demonstrate the love of God so that they can have a relationship with the Father, so that they can get His love, and that that love can spill over so that they can love others. And we've started a cycle that will change the world. When I go and I'm speaking to men and I'm loving on men about their marriages and I'm saying, hey, men, you need to get your marriages right. I'm not just talking about, I'm not loving on men just for the sake of having a good conference. I want them to take the love that they've received from me to home to their wives so that they can start loving on their wives so that the love of God can start working in their marriage so that they can come back and love on me by giving me a testimony about how God is working in their marriage. It's a full circle. And so when we have a look at this, it starts by loving those who are different from me. For most humans, the threshold is whether or not we like each other or not. I'll push through and be your neighbor if you like me. And I'll push through and be your neighbor if I like you. But for Jesus, the threshold is whether you'll acknowledge that we need him or not. If you are willing to acknowledge that you need Jesus, I will spend every waking moment of my life devoted to helping you find Jesus because that's what I needed when Jesus found me. How many of you know 
that there were probably hundreds of people praying for you when you were without Jesus. They were praying for you. They were begging God to make a way. For Pete's sake, they hated you so much that they needed God to step in. And so when you look at it, we need to understand that we just need to figure out a way of showing people that they need Jesus. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28 says this, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. There is neither black nor white, nor South African nor American. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If we can get people to see the love of Christ in their lives, segregation and prejudice will fall away. When we can tell the story of, of the gospel, we don't have to worry about cultural barriers because we are all one in Jesus Christ. Oh, can women be, be leaders in the church? Well, we are all one in Jesus Christ. Oh, but hang on a second. What about this scripture and that scripture and the other scripture? Stop being so prejudiced and get to the love God and love your neighbor piece before you get to the law piece. Oh, but we can't, they don't know Jesus, so we can't reach out to them. Number of churches, I go into their websites and I have a look at their mission. To reach Christians of our community, I'm going segregated. To, to reach those who love Jesus. I don't, <laughs> they've already got love. I don't need to give them some more. I'm not, I, I want to love people who've got love, love Jesus. Don't get me wrong. But my calling, my desire, my wake up in the moment, in the morning moment, is saying, who doesn't love Jesus in my life? I need to get desperate about being their neighbor. I need to get serious about loving people I don't understand. And let me tell you something, when you're a sold out Christian, those who don't know Jesus are very difficult to understand. Because you can't go... Up to and when we form a group and we invite that group into our world and into our vulnerability and into our heart, watch Jesus bless you by watching other people through that group come to Jesus Christ. I got into a group of dads. Kevin was just born, and I didn't have a cotton-picking clue on how to be a dad. I'd never had a good example of a father. And when I got into this group called Fathers back in South Africa, the Lord began to unpack things. Little did I know that there were two or three men that had targeted me knowing that I was in that situation and that they knew I needed not to get Jesus because I kind of already had him, but I needed to understand what his relationship meant for me. By the third week of that father's ministry, I was on my knees weeping before the Lord, and these men were praying around me. I didn't come for weeping and praying. I come to learn how to change a diaper. But there I was encountering a brand new understanding of my relationship with Jesus. And one of those men put his hand on the back of my shoulder and he said, you will find unconventional ways of preaching the gospel. And when I look back at that moment because of that life group, I'm standing here today preaching to cameras and online platforms around the world because somebody invited me to a men's group a father's group, to help me be a better father. You can have that excitement. That gentleman's name is Tim. He now lives in Australia. He's one of the, my best friends. We don't speak half as much because he's an Australian. I don't like Australian, but it's fine. I can forgive him. He's a South African living in a, yeah, let's not talk about Australia. They beat us in rugby last night, so I'm not very happy with them right now. But the fact remains is that you can be part of changing the world by just having someone in your home, by praying for somebody, by making a knife together, by exercising, by working out. You can create that group in your community. Will you? Because you see, that is how we can practically start being good neighbors. So let's pray with you, and then I'm going to hand over to Mike, who's going to give you some information on how we can get this done. Father, we just ask with every head bowed and eye closed, that you show us right now a revelation, a revelation of what it means to be a good neighbor. Father, right now, will you just take away any preconceived ideas of, of thinking that, yes, we are good neighbors. 
Yeah, I've been a good neighbor for many years. And really inject in us a new understanding of what you meant by this is your neighbor. And what we need to do to those neighbors and what we need to do for those people to be the kind of neighbor you have called us to be. Father, we love you and we want others to love you too. But to do that, we're going to have to step out of our way and invite people into our homes, lead groups we've never thought of leading, do things that we've never thought of doing so that we can be able to be all you have called us to be. So right now, as we come together, I just want to ask you in your place where you are right now, with head bowed and eye closed to give people around privacy, how many of you have felt that, yes, there's some things in my life and there's some people in my life that I've been pushing aside that I need to get to so that I can be a good neighbor? Is that you? Then just raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you over here. Thank you at the back. Thank you in the middle. Thank you right at the back. Thank you over here on the left. Thank you. Anybody else just want to acknowledge, yes, there's people in my life that I've been prompted to today. Yes, I want to be a neighbor to that person. Father, we thank you that you have called us and you have asked us and we will go. We will find a way of going and seeking the lost and bringing them home to be part of your family. And we pray this now in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Yes, Pastor Micah.